103 cu 4, Radio 7, suntem live pe radio, suntem live și pe 13 TV, 13 TV fiind un canal de YouTube. Doamnelor și domnilor, în această minunată seară ne-am adunat aici, pentru că este o seară specială, Lady First, Corina Minda și colegul ei de viață, Roni Romero. Welcome! Che tal, mi amigos? <laughs> Thank you! Welcome. Mulțumim de invitație. Eu foarte mulțumesc că ați venit. First of all, I want to say I don't have much appreciation for rock stars like you who come to Romania and took our beautiful girls. <laughs> This is like a declaration of war. <laughs> But it's not my fault, I can say. <laughs> I just fell in love. How uh, meet each other? Uh, uh, we met, um, fortunately. Um, we just... Uh, be in the same place at the same time. Uh, I was I was doing a tour with uh, Leo Leoni from Gothard in, in Italy and Milan, and she was doing modeling in Milan at the same time. So we just met and uh, we just discovered that, I discovered that she is a big fan of rock music and everything. And so uh, we match from the beginning and that's it. So I, that's what I say, it's not my fault that I fell in love. <laughs> How many years ago? 2019. Yeah. Mm, recently, okay. Recently. Okay, nice to meet you. Enjoy my envy. <laughs> I, I, I will make you a short presentation for our listeners. Okay. Uh, Corina, o să te rog uh, pe cât pot să mă corectez dacă greșesc. Ronnie Romero este din Chile, a locuit o vreme în Madrid, a cântat în diferite proiecte muzicale, a fost una din vocile, este una din vocile trupei Rainbow. You are still in Rainbow, actually, um, if they have gigs. Yes. Ok, <laughs> perfect. Uh, și uh, cum a cântat el într-o formație tribut Rainbow, a primit un telefon și a ajuns vocalistul formației Rainbow, după cum spuneam. Tot Ron este vocea albumelor lui Adrian Vandenberg de la Whitesnake și a lui Michael Schenker de la vechiul UFO, cine iubește bazele heavy metalului, aș putea spune, Schenker, Michael Schenker fiind și fratele lui Rudolf Schenker de la Scorpions. Ce ar mai fi de adăugat? Ar mai fi de adăugat, mi-am notat pe foie aici, alte proiecte al Ronnie, The Ferryman, Core Leoni, I said it right? Yes. Lords of Black, Stun- Sunstorm uh, și o să-l numim și pe cel mai recent, foarte interesant pentru mine, o colaborare cu niște muzicieni bulgari se numește Intelligent Music Project. Avem și... Uh, stai, 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 stai. Avem și două CD-uri aici de la la camera. Ok? Iar cu Intelligent Dance Music... Uh, sorry. Intelligent Music Project, da? O să aveți o cântare, dacă toate lucrurile se vor rezolva, pe 21 mai la Arenele Romane București. Ajută-mă cu detalii, Corina. Da, o să fie pe 21 mai la Arenele Romane, să sperăm că se va ține concertul. Um, noi am pus biletele la vânzare deja pe ea bilet. O să avem 30 de bilete VIP și restul până la 500, după cum știe toată lumea că maxim 500 este capacitatea, o să fie regular. Um, eu sper totuși că o să se întâmple concertul, vom vedea până la sfârșitul lunii ce ne anunță și... Uh, Domnule, ce să se întâmple... Uh... Poți să-mi spui ceva despre invitați? Am văzut pe afiș că este Alin Dincă, coiotul de la da. Trooper, căruia trebuie eu să-i mulțumesc pentru prezența voastră aici. El o să fie acolo. Mai avem și da, alte Alin nume Dincă de dat. o să fie acolo. Um, nu știu dacă ar trebui să dau aceste detalii, dar o să, o să cânte o piesă cu trupa, probabil undeva la finalul concertului. Iar ceilalți doi artiști, inițial a fost John Payne de la trupa Asia, Um, nu o să mai vină din păcate din cauza restricțiilor chiar astăzi am aflat și noi o să anunțăm și pe celelalte canale de socializare o să fie în locul lui Carl Sentence uh-huh. este um, o să mă ajute Roni puțin uh, Carl is, um, is a singer for Nazareth actually Nazareth. and for the Don 80 band Axel Rose was a big fan of Nazareth voice. Oh, yeah. yeah. They, they have some similarities. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Exactly. 
Ok. Și Bobby Rondinelli a fost oboșar Rainbow. În Black Sabbath. Și Black Sabbath. Oh. Care va veni. <laughs> El a confirmat. Păi trebuie să fim acolo negreșit da. cu toții. What an adventurous and tremendous and fucking beautiful life you have. <laughs> I, yeah, I can't complain actually. <laughs> They have very, very... Um, Uh, hardcore fans around the world um and for me it's that's really nice because um you know my in my short career and the endeavors that i did uh, during my career playing with rainbow with michael schenker with adrian vandenberg with leo leoni from gotthard and many others uh normally i am always uh, replacing uh, other singers So the people is always comparing, you know, like this is, I I don't, I don't like this because I prefer Ron James Dio. I don't like It's this a very I'm heavy like legacy. Yeah. <coughs> It's yeah. a very heavy, heavy <coughs> rock and roll legacy and uh, I saw some comments on YouTube. Yeah. Everybody have good words about you. Yeah. They love you. Yeah, mostly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, uh, to me it's okay because uh, I can understand as a fan that Uh, there is a new guy coming replacing, for example, Jolene Turner in a band. Uh, they're gonna prefer to Jolene Turner to stay in the band and not this new guy, you know. So I can understand the, you know, the bad comments in a way. Uh, and that's that's why I'm telling that the my fans they're really very loyal and very hardcore fans, and they support me, and they were supporting me through the uh, th- through the years. In everything that I do, so yeah, I don't know if I have groupies. I never, I never actually. If you ask me, I'm a very normal person, normal guy. Even when I'm touring, I'm the kind of guy that you know. I go to the show, and then after the show, I go to sleep. You know, <laughs> uh, I, I, I'm not a party guy. Um, so to me, in the circle, are you sick or something? <laughs> uh, yeah, and the and the the circle surrounds me when I'm touring, when I'm, or when I'm working with the musicians is just. Um, about the music um, and that's the important thing so um, I never experienced that kind of life of a rock star or the Motley Crue movie something like that no it's not it's not my it's not my kind of uh, my cup of tea let's say okay got it you are kind of like Angus Young you drink tea and go to sleep exactly okay <laughs> <laughs> I got it um, I guess two years ago the Purple uh, made uh, the last tour And uh, the press uh, asked uh, the members of the Purple if uh, they gonna invite um, Richie Blackmore. Mm-hmm. And they suggest it's a very difficult con- kind of guy to work with. And uh, he, uh, if he came back, he kind of broke the, the chemistry in the band. Mm. How was it for you to work with uh, Richie Blackmore? Um, I- I mean, to me, it was really easy, actually. Um, as I told you before, off of the microphone, uh, it's um, it's really easy to work with all those legends. I'm talking not just Richie Blackmore, but Michael Schenker, because Michael Schenker is a difficult guy, too. Let's yeah, I heard they that. Say, they say that. But uh, when you understand that, you go there and you just need to do your job and not to complain of everything, not to act like a diva or like a... Ego, big ego vocalist. It's really easy, you know. Um, you need to understand that they hire you for a specific job, which is to sing the songs, and that's it. And they give you everything. Uh, there is nothing to complain about it. Um, so, so it's really easy, you know. It's I can understand that the guys from the Purple maybe they can say because they were working with him for 50 years actually, uh, and they are all big legends. So probably between them there is a clash of egos or something um rich is a really um, a very controlling person in in the band because he wants to be over everything every a detail exactly mm-hmm. uh the same is is uh, michael schenker um i remember the first time when i met uh michael we were rehearsing for if i remember correct we were rehearsing for eight hours continually without any stop because he wants to be uh, in every detail that you need to go from this side of the stage when you're not singing, you need to be here, um, you need to do this and this and this. Richie Blackmore is the same thing. If you understand that and you can carry this uh, way of work, it's really easy. Actually, to me, um, all the years that I was working with Richie so far, they were very, very nice experiences. He's a very nice guy. Um, 
he always supports me, give me advices of, on the business, music business. Uh, he's very funny. We're always joking. So maybe I think it's maybe it's because it's really old <laughs> too. <laughs> you know, so probably I met him in his quiet times. I don't know. Um, do you have any moment, uh, especially in the first gig you have with Rainbow, yeah. and you were on stage, and you have, uh, I guess, on your left side, uh, Richie Blackmore, mm -hmm. and the other guys from Rainbow, from the band, yeah. do you have that moment, what the fuck am I doing here? <laughs> yeah. How, I mean, how, can I, how can I get here now? Yeah, what can um, I do? Yeah, um, actually, I got this feeling from the beginning, since I was... I was Uh, I, I got this f this first message from Richie when he contacted me for to join Rainbow. Imagine I I grew up listening to Purple. My father, rest in peace, he was a big fan of the Purple. So I was listening to Purple since I remember, since I was a kid. Uh, my favorite record probably is Made in Japan, the, this double record. And I was listening Made in Japan every day in my teenage Um, I was actually pretending to be Ian Gillen in my room in front of the mirror with a fake microphone, you know, that kind of things. Yeah, and then suddenly, we all do that. Exactly. So su suddenly, some people have talent, some people don't. <laughs> <laughs> suddenly, uh, one day, actually at that time I was playing in a rainbow cover band. Um, yeah, that's a nice story. Yeah. Um, I met some guys in Madrid and we put a, a rainbow cover band together because the guitar player... He has this uh, kind of a uh, Richie Blackmore way to play, and he plays with the Stratocaster and everything. So it was really similar. Um, and then everybody was saying that it sounds similar to Ronnie James Dio. So we put a Rainbow cover band together, and it was really successful. You know, um, uh, we were playing some festivals in Spain, and we were doing some tours, local tours in Spain, and many cities playing the the all these uh, Rainbow Rainbow songs. And then suddenly one day. Early in the morning, I was doing my job, and then suddenly I got this message from Richie Blackmore itself, like telling me we were watching some videos from you. It looks amazing. You thought it was a joke? Actually, my first thought it was uh, there was a hiding camera or something like that, you know. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and then and then and then I was f for at least two weeks reading the emails every day in case that I missed something or that I understood wrong something because at that time I didn't I didn't talk English at all. So, um, and I'm talking about six years ago, I didn't talk English at all. So I was trying to understand what's going on and I was, you know, in my couch sitting, is this real? Is Richie Blackmore telling me that I, I'm going to be the rainbow singer? And then everything happens. I We met for the first time. Uh, we were rehearsing, um, and then on the first show, it was in Lorelei in Germany, in front of, uh, I think it was 17,000 people. Uh, there was a Monsters of Rock festival, there was uh, Thin Lizzy playing, Manfred Mann playing, and then we played, and yeah, I, I, I look over my shoulder to my left side, and Richie was there, and I didn't get scared, but I was... Um, I, I really felt that my dreams came true at that time because I always dreamed to be the rainbow singer or the, the purple singer and suddenly I was there on the stage with Richie Blackmore. So Now with all uh, your stage experience, do you still get nervous before the show? How can you deal with your emotions? Um, um, fortunately, I'm not the kind of guy to get nervous, never. Uh, it's really hard to me to get nervous for something. It should be something really, really hard, uh, personally hard to to get nervous. But on a stage, to me, is um, just to have fun, you know. And 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 I mean, music is it's my life, and this is the thing that I love to do. So I really want to go there to the stage. I'm not the kind of guy that's it's it's a big show. I'm nervous. I, I'm how I'm gonna do it or whatever. It's just I really want to do it. So, so I never get nervous, and it's really, really cool for me to be on a stage. So, especially as a frontman, you have to deal, especially in rock bands, yeah. you have to deal with uh, some energy coming from the crowd. Yeah, and uh, I think you have to be signed some kind of tough guy to deal with it. How can you deal with uh, that energy from the crowd? Um, uh, so, yeah, sometimes it's difficult. Uh, there is some 
special audiences. Um, I, I would say, especially in Scandinavia, um, they are very. Um, uh, they're always looking at you in case you make a mistake, right? Um, and sometimes they don't like too much the set list or the sound, or they're always complaining on some things. But um, I think it's, it's just about to be sure with what you are doing on a stage. And and I can say that every time that I go to the stage, I'm pretty sure what I'm doing and I'm doing right. And, and, and that's why those big legends from rock music, they called me to be on a stage with them. Not just Blackmore, but as I told you before, Blackmore, Schenker, Vandenberg, and many others. If they called me to be in the band, is because I'm a good singer. At least a yes, good singer. Are. A good singer. Facts. I'm, I'm Facts not, I'm not saying that I'm the mm-hmm. best singer ever, but at least I'm good. So it's uh, that gave me a lot of confidence to be on the stage, and it's it's easy to to deal with the energy from the venue and from the people when 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 you are self confident. Do you feel con- comfortable uh, in a big festival stages or a small club? What is better for you? Um, I, I like both. Uh, it's really nice to be in a big stage and to play with a lot of people. Uh, is the feeling that you are successful, right? But if you ask me, I really prefer to be in a small club uh, with not too much people. I think it's more personal and you can express your feeling Yeah, in a better way. You know, when you're playing for 40,000 people, uh, actually you can't see the faces. So it's like you are seeing into the to the space, right? Um, and it's cool, you know, there's a lot of noise and there's a big stage and you can move at all through all the stages. It's very nice and the big productions and super cool. Uh, I, I did that. But when you go to a club for... It's more intimate. 200 somehow. people... And you can see every face and every motion that you are giving to them. I think that's the real sense of, of the music. Uh, beyond you meet Corina, tell me one moment as a rock singer mm. w- when you said to yourself, I'm the fucking king of the world. I fucking <laughs> made it. I work hard and, and it's worth it. Uh, yeah, actually, it was um, it was with Rainbow. Um, I think it was the best moment in my life as a Rainbow fan, actually, and then as a musician, because we played in Munich, uh, 2019. Uh, we were doing a tour on Europe, and we play in the same venue that Rainbow did the uh, Munich 77 show with Ronnie James Dio. It was exactly the same venue, um, and to for me that was. Um, I mean, that moment that you never imagined that going to happen, you know, even when you get successful or whatever. I mean, I play the O2 in London. I play the uh, Olimpinski Stadium in in Moscow. We play in big venues in St. Peter- St. Petersburg. We play Monsters of Rock in Germany, a couple of them. Um, we play a big festival in Spain, I remember, that year. But to play in the Olympia Hall, Uh, venue in Munich, the same place that Rainbow play with this iconic lineup: Ronnie James Dio, Bob Disley in the in the bass, um, um, uh, obviously Richie Blackmore, um, uh, and they play this Long Live Rock and Roll album there. Um, they release an album there actually. There's a live album called Munich '77, and to be in the same stage that. Uh, that um, Rainbow play in the 77 to me was the um, I think it was the top of my career I was like okay this is this is the what I was looking for during all my my musical career and and that's the moment it was not only a chance but a challenge it was a challenge okay uh, to play with Rainbow is always a challenge uh, as I told you before because the people is always um, comparing you know Yeah, I think it's a, it's a little bit hard, but it's also man stuff to say fuck you. I'm, uh, uh, yeah, now I'm way. here, I'm fucking alive, and I'm singing uh, that, and I'm singing a, good in a way. But uh, I think I never I never needed to 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 send the fuck off the people because you know um, Marilyn Manson did it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I was I was playing. Um, we were playing songs for uh, Deep Purple and all the singers from Rainbow. So I was doing I was doing the job 
that Ian Gillen, David Coverdale, Joelin Turner, Ronan James Dio, Graham Bonnet did before. Uh, the same guy. Heavy legacy. The same guy. <laughs> so uh, always the people is comparing, try to compare that. that is, I don't like this. I prefer the old one. But at the end, uh, in every show, in every tour, um, the mostly of the comments were that this guy is good and he can do it. And he was the same guy who was doing all those singers in the same show. Um, so yeah, so th- I, I think I convinced the people with my with my work. You have to give me one case when you fucked up on stage. Oh uh, yeah, I did. <laughs> I did a give couple me that of times. Story. I, I did a couple of times. Uh one, once I mean I was I was fucked it up at the time. I remember we were doing a tour with uh, my band Lords of Black. It was the first European tour out of Spain. Um it was the first album we signed with Frontiers Records. So it was a kind of I was in Rainbow at the time already, so uh there was a there was a, a lot of uh, people coming to the shows because of the Rainbow Singer, mm-hmm. right? And and I got sick. Uh we were in UK playing and I got sick. I got the I got a um, uh, inguinal hernia when I was oh, during that's the tough. during the tour. So I was playing the half of the tour. I was playing uh, drug because of the pills for for the mm-hmm. pain, and and there was the most uh, successful song of the band at that time. Um, it was on the encores, and I was totally drugged, and I didn't remember the lyric at all. <laughs> so the song became in a instrumental version, right? <laughs> because I couldn't handle it. Uh, the people didn't understand that, but. Anyway, and then the second time it was with Rainbow, we were playing, I think it was the second tour in 2018, and I completely forgot, and I don't ask me why, because I don't know why, I was listening that song for many years, and then suddenly on the stage I forgot the Stargazer lyrics. Oh. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that was tough. <laughs> yeah. So I fucked it up a little bit with the, I changed the verses, you know, um. Uh, 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 I put the second verse. Uh, I sang the third verse on the second verse, and and then I I repeat myself. And I I know I know that people. I saw that on that. <laughs> with Dio on Black Sabbath. Yeah. In heaven and hell. But you know the good the thing. Same. The good thing that uh, from Ron James Dio, for example, that uh, Richie told me actually he was really good. He was really good improvising lyrics on on a stage. He has a, a lot of lyrics on his head, so suddenly he can. If 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 it was not remembered the lyrics, he can improvise something, you know. So it looks like he's improvising or changing something on the on the song. But I I I don't have that skill, so <laughs> I completely fucked it up. <laughs> um, the vocalists always fascinate me because uh, they have a very good memories. Mm. Uh, for me, it's impossible to, to have in mind so much lyrics ah. uh, do you uh, use some uh, memories uh, exercises for that um no actually the way that i do and i think that the mostly of the vocalists do is the uh, is a nemo technique uh which is to remember uh, the the melody and while you remember the melody uh, you associate the word on that melody So if you remember the how it's a is, synopsis yeah on so the brain. if you remember okay. how is the vocal line actually uh you you fit the vocal line with the with the words so you don't need to remember the words actually you just remember the vocal line mm-hmm. the line of the melody it's um, like a, a room you know and you just enter and uh, go to the kitchen go to the balcony yeah and sometimes yeah. when you, when you can go in your house with the uh, with the lights off you know you remember that yes, there is yes, you know there is There is a table there. Mm-hmm. You remember that. It's the same thing. Uh, so, for example, if you say uh, the Gates of Babylon song from from Rainbow, if you remember that as da 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 da, you remember that the word is uh, exactly in in the verse is with that vocal line. So it's mm-hmm. really easy to remember. Look away from the sea. That's it. How was your lockdown, Corina? Uh, our lockdown. Our or? <laughs> yours lockdown. <laughs> Um I think it was nice in a way. Vorbesc în engleză sau în română? Vorbesc în română. Okay. Um, We're talking noi... about your lockdown. Yeah, I understood, yeah. 
Da, au fost uh, aproximativ, cel puțin pentru mine, au fost două luni, fiindcă două luni uh, nu am lucrat. S-a închis clinica stomatologică unde lucrez eu, așa că practic am fost în vacanță două luni. Pentru noi nu pot să zic că a fost ceva greu, fiindcă aveam oarecum nevoie amândoi de o vacanță. Am călătorit destul de mult în țară, în special în Brașov, fiindcă e aproape și lui Ron îi place foarte mult. Um, ce să zic, am gătit foarte mult, am cântat, ne-am preocupat mai mult de lucruri de, de ale casei, să zic așa. A fost o perioadă frumoasă Înțeles, pentru noi. Cele frumoase și domestice <laughs> da. de lângă casă. Uh, do you think uh, that crazy times we are living now, uh, the music industry is mm. gonna change in the future or it's gonna be back to normal? No, it's, it's never gonna back to normal. It changed already. Uh, we, we're doing this, um, we're passing through this pandemic since more than a year already yeah a year a little bit more than a year since the lockdown the first lockdown and it completely changed um you can't imagine obviously um um and and, and everything is related with the uh, economic situation because obviously for example um there is no shows obviously so um if the people understand that the 80% of the incomes for a musician comes from the live shows. Uh, you have of 80% less of incomes. Um, Little then, joys of life. Uh, yeah. yeah, so um, uh, then you have only the record sales. But the people, they, don't, they are not working, so they don't have money to buy records. Fact, I agree. So uh, actually, right now, the record sales is about only the 30% of what it was before the lockdown. So we're talking about um, in the economic and the monetary side, it completely changed. And not, I mean, it's going to be really hard to get back to normal. Um, if we can make shows, uh, it's going to be the prices and the fees and budgets and everything is going to be lower than ever uh, because the people, they don't have money. Um, people, I think, always have... In Romania, uh, for sure, uh, uh, to pay for the tests, you know, COVID uh, test uh, at the end. Yeah, and, and and imagine that the, for example, if you have a show and um, there is some restrictions, the people is not buying tickets because they're waiting if the show is going to happen or not. That means that one week before the show, if you don't know the pe- the show is going to happen, but you need to cancel, but be- because there is one week for the show and you don't have any ticket sales. Uh, I saw Guns N' Roses, uh, Hollywood Vampires, and uh, Judas mm. Priest uh, rescheduled for the next year. Yeah. Do you have something from the next year for the next year? Uh, I mean, I was I was rescheduling two shows for the last two years actually. Two years. Uh, for example, I supposed to do make a, sh- uh, a tour with Vandenberg, uh, and it was twice postponed. Uh, the uh, Michael Schenker tour it was postponed two times already. Um, All the f- big festivals I was supposed to play with Michael Schenker in the Hellfest, in the grass pop metal music, and they were postponed. The Sweden Rock was postponed already. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's not going to happen. Um, I was supposed to be with, uh, this month actually, with uh, Rock Meets Classics in, in Germany, and they already postponed the last tour for this year, and they postponed again for the next year. So we're talking about if we can make shows, That's going to ha- happen not before 2022-23. And imagine that. Yeah, that's, that's and scary. imagine how it's for all the people who is related with the shows, not just the musicians, but the promoters. If they're bringing, if they're bringing with uh, Judas Priest, for example, uh, in a venue for 500 people. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's lame. It, yeah, exactly. It looks lame, yes. I mean, Judas Priest. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's, it's completely changed. And then, uh, musicians, we needed to create in a way new forms to keep the people related with the music, for example, to make online shows, which is, I don't like it, but I think it's the only way to show up in a way. Yeah. But I heard, uh, uh, the online shows doesn't sell so much tickets actually. No, because the people, they want to see the band live. Not truly. I mean, I I can see the I can see any band on YouTube, so I don't need to <laughs> I don't need to see the band on YouTube and pay for it. 
mm. right? Uh, um, right? Yeah, the people they don't like it, um, but it's the it's the only way nowadays to make something. Um, and then on, on the records, um, you need to put not just one single before the release. You need to put three, four, five singles before. That means that when you buy the record, if you buy it, if you buy it. Um, you know the record already. It's not like in the old days when you were going to the record store and buy the record from Deep Purple and waiting to be at home to open the box and listen to music and and to check what it's inside. I know what you're talking about because I, I'm a big fan of vinyl and I want to buy vinyl and kind of sustain the, the little uh, uh, corner shop, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's coming back. It's coming back in a way because the people, since they don't have the live music, they are going back to, to, survive to, buy, to buy some things, physical records, mostly vinyls. Uh, actually, for example, Frontiers, my record label, uh, they are releasing all the albums in, a, in vinyl too. So it's, I think the people like it. Um, but yeah, uh, there, is no, there is no this excitement anymore to buy a record. You have the record on... I mean, on the release date, you have it on YouTube, you have it on uh, internet to download it for free, you have it on Spotify for free. La concert uh, pe care îl programați pe 21 mai o să aveți și merchandising? Da, o Lumea să avem. Lumea să cumpere cd Tricouri și O să avem, fi. o să avem. Mm-hmm. Ok, that's good. Um, you are from Chile. Yep. I have uh, uh, the chance twice in my life to be in the other side of the world. I've been in Madagascar once and I've been in Dominican Republic twice, okay? Okay. I stayed there for a while. Because of the food, because of the nature, the oceans, the fruits, because of the people, I I found that place is very exotic. Mm -hmm. From you, coming from Chile to Madrid and coming from Madrid here at Mm -hmm. the edge of the Orient, It's uh, something uh, exotic for you? Um, I'm not, not, not too much in the way that, for example, when I moved to Madrid um, almost 12 years ago, um, um, the Spanish society is pretty similar to, I mean, they're Latin. Um, so it's, it's not that different. Actually, Madrid physically is very similar to Santiago de Chile. Very similar, uh, even the streets and the on the because we were we were colony of Spain. Yes, I know. So I, I, but the Spanish is not a little bit different in Chile. Uh, yeah, I mean, in, in South America in general, it's uh, the Spanish language is a little bit different, but it's not it's not hard to used to it. But in in the way you say that um, to found exotic, no, not really. I found it sorry when I went to Tokyo for the first time. <laughs> that, okay, that's that the other was planet. Different. Exactly. I heard. Um, and then, and then, um, it's funny because uh, when I move, when I moved to Romania, when I moved to Bucharest with Corina, obviously you have all these um, preconceived ideas that you know this is a very poor country on the Eastern European side, and and um, they are not in the rest of European countries level, infrastructure or whatever. But, I mean, uh, to me, it's, it's pretty cool. I mean, it's, very, it's a very nice country. Um, and it's pretty similar to Chile. Uh, that, and that's, that was really funny for me, the, the cultural and the uh, society, the, the Romanian people is very similar to the Chilean people. Corina, cook for you Romanian food? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I love it. I mean, and he started to cook for me Romanian yeah. food. <laughs> well, yeah. What did you make? Uh, Sarmale? No, <laughs> no. I normally uh, we normally make um, uh, soups, uh, chorba. Okay. Because I love it. And actually, for example, the uh, you have here the chorba de fasole cucholan. That's tough. And and that's a uh, that's a uh, that's a uh, chorba in Chile, which is pretty much the same thing. Mm-hmm. It's the same thing. Uh, with the difference that sometimes in Chile we add uh, spaghetti on the soup. But that's it. Uh, no different condiments? No, no, no. It's pretty much the same. Fasole mm-hmm. and the cholan, you call it the uh, this uh, kind of a bacon thing. It's the same thing. Tell me a rock and roll story. Tell me uh, the moment in you, uh, when you uh, discover 
the first band uh, yeah. rock you like you are from chile i, I heard uh, it, i know in all um uh, so, uh, south america heroes del silencio was uh, a big selling uh yeah yeah they were they were uh they're from spain but they were uh, from actually, madrid they were pretty successful mm-hmm. actually in in europe too and germany especially i think But then in South America too. Then. But normally in to South America, it was really hard to get rock music. Um, they were the most successful people. They were the pop uh, musicians. Latino merengue. Not just that, but um, uh, more um, pop music from America, from the States or from Europe. Um, so it was really, uh, actually the rock music was a little bit under- underground, you know. Um, and it's funny because when i listen now chilean rock bands for example they sounds like pop right mm. <laughs> because of the influence there was not too much um um rock music coming on even mostly because of the dictatorship uh periods of in argentina in in brazil in chile we were passing through a lot of yeah, Argent- um, brazil have sepultura now yeah <laughs> but but yeah there was a little bit and they were not successful in south america they were successful in America or in Europe, yeah, you know, you know. Um, but fortunately for me, I was I grew up listening rock music because my father he was a f- huge fan of rock music, especially classic rock bands from America like uh, Boston, Kansas, uh, that kind of things. Uh, some guitar players like Steve Ray Vaughan, Frank Marino, obviously Jimi Hendrix, and then they they came with uh, um, the bands from UK like like Led Zeppelin of the Purple. So as I grew up listening to this music. Um and fortunately even more for me uh when I decided to listen rock music when I was I don't know maybe eight years old. Um and then at and my and my teenaging um I put my first band together with a schoolmate. How old were you? Uh I think I was 14. Mm-hmm. As and a vocalist. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I was I, singing at that time already. I, I was a vocalist too at the 14, but that was not good. <laughs> It didn't work, right? No, no. <laughs> um, I, I grew up singing because um, my fam- my family, they were all musicians. My father, he was a singer. He was a crooner on a uh, big band. My grandfather, he was a saxophonist. My mother used to play the guitar. My brother, he was a drummer. Um, so, yeah, I grew up singing. I was singing in the in the gospel choir in, in, in the church. Um, and then one day I just, um, I was telling you the story of, um, this friend of mine from the school, we put a band together and his father, he was a huge fan of rock music too. So he was giving us a lot of records to listen. Jimi Hendrix and, um, Pink Floyd, um, a lot of Kansas we listened at the time. Um, t- uh, Ten Years After, Grand Funk Railroad, um, uh, Eagles. Yes, yeah, so a all lot those, of the 70s. All those classics mm-hmm. from the 70s. Mm-hmm. Um, and then suddenly uh, this guy came one day with a tape. Actually, it was not an original tape. It was something that you re-record from the radio. Um, and it was, um, it was a tape for Whitesnake, Starkers in Tokyo. This acoustic show he did. Uh, David Coverdale and Adrian Vandenberg. And that was the first time that I that I listened David Coverdale singing, so I put the record and it was like I was blown away, and I, 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 that was the moment when I decided I I want to be like David Coverdale, <laughs> mm-hmm. I want to be this kind of singer with a lot of soul on the vocals, but you know strong at the same time and very aggressive and sometimes and but a lot of soul and blues and that kind of things. So we put a band together and we were playing all those songs in a club for. I don't remember, maybe 10 euros per night, something like that. I saw Coverdale in Bucharest uh, at the uh, one moment. He received some flowers from a girl mm-hmm. in public and he said, thank you and thank you for your tits. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that It's was ve- from the live in the still of the night. I'm not sure if it was in Bucharest. It was in Bucharest. Uh, he, he always uh, say that. Uh, I, I think it's a DVD. pattern he used to yeah, put it he, in the I think he always day. do that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You think he's cool like that? Ah, he is. He's, he was very good on this on the sexy side, but <laughs> that's 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 for him, not for me, actually. Can you give me? Uh, can you name me five 
albums mm-hmm. in uh, all whole rock and roll history who influenced you who find it very special yeah 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 and um, why uh the first one is the one that i told you already is the uh, um, star tears in tokyo from white snake um actually the first rock song that i sang was here i go again on the acoustic version And then um, I remember I was in a school and 14 years old and and we did it with this schoolmate. He was playing the guitar and I was doing the song. And and every time that we have a meet on a school, everybody was saying, oh, can you sing this one because you do it really well. So I was singing a lot of Here I Go Again. So that album for me was the the point of uh, no return from listening to rock music and to try to become a rock singer. So it's very important to me. And then imagine to suddenly end up working with the guitar player of that record, which is Adrian Vandenberg, and we record an album. Uh, so I think he's kind of a, a very underrated a good guitarist. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, he has huge success with the uh, with the Vandenberg before Whitesnake. Um, and actually, for example, Burning Heart, which is probably his most successful song, From Vandenberg, uh, they are still playing the song in America and the radios. Still, mm-hmm. oh, that's nice. So imagine, um, yeah, he's, he's he's really good, and he's a very nice guy actually, as well. Uh, then the second record probably is the Rising album from Rainbow. Um, that was the record that I makes me discover Ronnie James Dio for the first time, um, and and I love that record. I mean, every song is. And to me, it's like... Uh, Dio had the, the, that uh, gift to have an impact on people when you heard him, whoa. Yeah, because the first time. Uh, he's not a typical rock or heavy metal singer. He, he, ha- he used to have a lot of different elements on the vocal. And those singers that you can listen in a very soft song and you don't think that he's the same guy who is screaming in other songs. <laughs> yeah, so he has a huge right. range doing different dynamics. And, and that's... There's not, there, there's, there's not too much people that they can do that. So yeah, I was uh, Rainbow Rising for me is probably probably one of the my tops albums. Um, that's that's two the albums. Second, so yeah. you you say five, right? Yep. Okay. Um, after that, probably White Snake. Uh, uh, come and get it. Um, I, we were we were listening some of that music on the car when we were coming. Ah, uh, you are in the moment in the relationship. You're both of you listening uh, uh, love song <laughs> from White Snake. Okay, that's nice. Uh, from the beginning, because she is a f- huge fan of White Snake, so that was one of the things that I liked from her when we met. Uh, you have to thank Cover there for that. Because she knows, she knows, uh, she knows about music. Is not that kind of person that you need to show her. Mm-hmm. music J- discover this oh I-, i like this i know it's very like it. comfortable yeah exactly uh, and she knows that the records and you know so it's it's really cool um um for me that first era from white snake with uh, moody and marsden on the guitars uh bernie marsden especially is one of my favorite guitar players uh they were more bluesy Um, uh, so I like I, I like a lot that that era from White Snake, most that the glam era after. Um, I make a, a, a short pause to say, uh, in the lockdown, uh, having nothing to better to do, I listen a lot of uh, uh, albums. Mm-hmm. Uh, I I didn't have time to listen before, mm-hmm. okay? And I listened to uh, some uh, new White Snake. Uh-huh. And uh, realize that the mastering has changed. Mm. It's not uh, they don't use that compression they use in the 80s on the, in the 90s, you mm-hmm. know? Mm-hmm. And the the drums have the sound of uh, Pantera Vurgal display of power. <laughs> yeah. It was the same yeah. sound of yeah. the drums. It's yeah. okay, and, and uh, the guitar uh, um, distorts in, in the front, mm. very in the front. Yeah, that's that's a little bit sad because I'm I I think I mean I'm just wondering um, maybe it's because of um, uh, David Coverdale is singing in a lower key nowadays because of the limitations of the vocals, mm-hmm. um, so it it sounds more dark and heavy. So. 
they need to put the instrument a little bit up uh, to sound in that way. And it's really sad because if you listen to the first records, I mean the White Snake record, uh, come and get it, slide it in. That that's that's the real White Snake, you know, with really bluesy um, and 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 they be covered their vocals riding over the uh, you know the riffs and everything. It's it's totally different. There is a lot of soul there. There's not anymore because I mean they're singing two and a half step down with the vocals, so it sounds really dark. Mm, does it scare to you? Um, not really, not really. I mean there is a lot of bands there. Um, with their limitations, they're still doing great. For example, Europe, the band Europe, um, they're doing the same thing. Even really, Halford really manages somehow. I don't know and how it's, he's doing, it still but sounds he manages. Great. Yeah. Uh, but there is some others that they should get retired already. Yeah, I know that. <laughs> I'm not going to say names, but... Yeah. <laughs> uh, another two albums. Oh uh, yeah, another two albums. Um, the other ones probably... Uh, is the Machine Head from the Purple. Uh, that was my favorite record from the Purple since I was listening every day. Every day. Uh, I knew the songs, every lyric, every detail of the songs, every lick from the guitar, every drum fill. I was listening for, I don't know, maybe two years continually, every day. It happens to me with a Gogol Bordello song. It, it, was, uh, it, was, so, it was so amazing to you know. discover uh, the Purple, I remember. And, and, and I was, you know, listening every day and I was like, this is the best drummer in the world. This is the best guitar player. This is the best keyboard player, the best singer. Um, it was fantastic. You know, it was. Um, and then it's it's funny because you when you're listening nowadays, this record, you discover that they were putting the basis for rock music that we are playing now. Uh, there is a lot of heavy metal there. There is a lot of melodic and progressive metal. You didn't name records. yet the Black Sabbath album. Uh, actually, <laughs> actually, Black Sabbath is not one of my favorite bands. No. I mean, if you ask me, uh, sorry for the listeners if there is some fans of... But for example, Iron Maiden... Um, okay, the show is over. <laughs> Just no, kidding. No, I, I'm not saying that they're bad, obviously. Uh, but mm-hmm. I, I grew up listening to uh, different kind of music, so I never went into... Iron Maiden or Black Sabbath too much. I obviously I know. I the hope bands. Aline Aline Dink is not going <laughs> to listen to this. <laughs> and I think it's because I was always attracted by those kind of singers that I can um, reply. You know, like I can sing like them. So obviously Bruce Dickinson is not the kind of singers that I can sing. I can't because my vocal range is totally different. Mm-hmm. So obviously, since I cannot sing those songs. Uh, I'm not interest, interested to listen to those songs. You know? mm, okay. That, that's that's, my, that's yes, yes, my way of singing. Yeah, yeah. It's very um, interesting. So yeah, I was more interested to listen to Random James Dio, for example, because I can, you know, I can I can sing that way. Or David Coverdale, even Ian Gillen a little bit. That was more harder to sing. But um, And then because of my influences, I was listening more American melodic classic rock bands like as I told you before, Boston, Kansas, more melodic, Journey, um, that kind of things. So I never went into the heavy metal like Aero Maiden. Um, I know some songs and, you know, it's cool. Yeah, of course, everybody knows. Um, I, I know some lyrics, I never watch the lyrics, Black but Sabbath, I have everything Black Sabbath, to me, is the same thing. I know they're running James Dio era, but I don't like Ozzy Osbourne. Mm. I don't like him. I mean, um, obviously. It's a bluesy voice. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I mean, it's the same thing that happens to me with Metallica, for example. I don't know how to put it, uh, that kind of vocals, because uh, I try to I try to sing some Metallica songs sometimes, and it's really hard to sing in it because it's not properly melodic singing. You know, it's more like um, like a, a talking phrasing, even hip hop. You know, because they're talking all the time. You're so talking about uh, uh, how to to rephrase. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. It's really hard to do it. I mean, it, it's really hard to, for a melodic singer, it's really hard to, to sing a Metallica song. It's not easy. And I, I, what I'm saying is, is, a, is a very unique style of singing from James Hetfield. You know, uh, I'm not saying that he's a good or a bad singer, but it's a very unique. It's a very unique. I, I saw James Hetfield with Alice in Chains playing Woods, uh, the song from Alice in Chains, and he 
played like his yeah, yeah. voice. He, uh, it, There is it, nobody it, can it sing like him. He made it kind of Metallica song, you know. Nobody can sing like him. Mm-hmm. I, I was doing, you know, I was doing the last years um, uh, some shows in Russia with a Philharmonic Orchestra. We were playing Metallica songs. The, actually, the the show it calls uh, Metallica Romance. Mm-hmm. Was a tribute something. Yeah, but with a orchestra. Mm-hmm. Ooh, <clears throat> um, and at the beginning, uh, when they offered me this, I say, okay, oh, let's do it. I mean, Metallica. I can. I think I can do it. It was really hard. It was really hard to 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 get the point that it sounds like Metallica because it's really hard for for a melodic singer to sing that way. And it happens the same to me with Ozzy Osbourne. I was playing. Um, I was playing with the Gus G. The play. The, the guitar player stuff was, was yeah. with Ozzy. Mm-hmm. Uh, we put a band together like three years ago. It was a more like a funny project, like to play some shows together, and that's it. And it was the uh, Gus G on the guitars. It was uh, John Levin from Europe on the bass, and Anders Johansson from Hammerfall on the on the drums, and I was singing. So we were playing songs from Europe, we were playing songs from Rainbow, and we were playing songs from Ozzy Osbourne. And there was a specific song, I, uh, if I remember, uh, the name is uh, Fairs Wear Boots or something like that. Yes, it's a Black Sabbath song. It's a Black Sabbath song. <clears throat> it was a nightmare for me. It was a nightmare. It was really hard to sing that song because as well, like James Hetsfield, um, Ozzy Osbourne, he has a specific and unique way to sing. And it's really hard to, to, to sing in that way. It's really hard to do. So, so what I'm saying that is, uh, those those kind of singers they don't sound um, attractive to me to sing the songs, and that's why I never went into that kind of music. You know what the fairies was in that song? Um, at this time, uh, the skinheads uh, oh. used to hate the hippie guys. And confuse the Black Sabbath guys with the hippie guys ah, yeah. because they have long <laughs> hair, and uh, the Black Sabbath guys uh, uh, call the skinheads fairies. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah this is the yeah, song. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. About. Makes sense. They were very hippie at that time, right? <laughs> uh, very dark hippie. <laughs> yeah. It, it was after Charles Manson, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. murders. So. So yeah, it's it's really it's really hard to to sing Ozzy Osbourne songs. I mean, you can do it in your way, but it's not gonna sound like Black Sabbath. You know, so it's really hard to handle it. I I heard one uh, one Black Sabbath song with the uh, 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 the guy from um, Fleetwood Mac. It was a perfect bluesy sound, but with the uh, Aussie voice, it was a different song, just different. Yeah, uh, it's because they they are a unique way to to sing. The same like James. James is very like a hammer. Bam 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 bam. bam. It's it's not like a melodic thing, you know. So mm-hmm. so. So that means that when you are singing a Metallica song, you need to be really straight with the metric of the words to sound convincing. Um, and with Ozzy, he has a cadence like uh, 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 all the time, which is really hard to 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 sing. So it's that doesn't sound uh, as attractive to me to sing. One album. Ah uh, yes, one album <laughs> is uh, probably. Um, This um, a night at the opera from Queen. Um, obviously, everybody knows that. Everybody knows me. Knows that the Freddie Mercury is one of my biggest influences, and 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 that album is just. I mean, uh, what I can say, it's one of my favorites. How can you um, uh, manage your voice? Um, uh, to take care, you say. Uh, to take care, and uh, I'm also interesting before the concert. You you make vocalize in the backstage? Oh no, no, I'm not that kind of singer. Um, uh, somebody t- uh, told me, and I, I think I saw some footage. Was he was he do that? You know. I I mean I I I guess that it, it, it it is not important to get warm before. Uh, it I mean the vo- the voice is so personal, uh, and it depends of. Uh, in my experience, it depends on the um, physical shape. Uh, if you are the kind of singer that you don't take care too much of your body every day, obviously when you go to the show, you need to warm up a little bit and everything, and do exercises. There is some singers they do yoga before the show, that kind of things. Mm-hmm. 
I respect that, obviously. Um, but I take care of my body every day. And that means I take care of my vocals too. So obviously, for example, and that's one of the things that Corina helps me a lot to understand to eat healthy, for example, every day, not just on the tour, but to eat healthy every day. Um, less sugar. For example, this cup of coffee, and I asked you before for two sugars, I used to have seven on the coffee. <laughs> you know? Man, that, that's not coffee, that's cake. <laughs> exactly. So uh, I give you coffee, not cake. If you understand <laughs> that you need to eat healthy, you need to make exercises every day, I go running every day, you know, so you're always in shape. And then on the show, I mean, uh, I try to take care um, not to drink too much alcohol. Uh, I'm not saying that I don't drink alcohol. I drink alcohol. Uh, yeah, some vocalists uh, uh, used to drink before because uh, they told me they used to with, with the chords. Yeah, you know that's that that's yeah, a, that's whiskey a, actually, or something or that, vodka. Actually, that's a myth. Um, it's an excuse to drink. Exactly, it's an excuse to drink because I will tell them because the, I will tell them because the alcohol, oh, mostly the whiskey and those kind of those kind of strong uh, alcohol, what they do is to burn uh, the vocal cords, so you you feel you feel warm, and you think that you are warm to sing, but actually they are doing the opposite. Mm. <laughs> so. Um, because they are irritating the, the vocal yeah, yeah, I got it. Uh, so it's totally the opposite. <laughs> I, I thought it was the easiest uh, part uh, with uh, um, singing in the backstage. Yeah, you know, you, you, you drink a shot and you think, oh, this is warm. No, now I'm ready to sing. But you are destroying the vocal cords, actually. Um, <laughs> that's it. Uh, I told you before, uh, I, I love a band, Gogol Bordello. And they have a... a a lot of good songs, but one of them says, says like this. There is a punk rock mafia everywhere I go. She is good to me and I am good to her. <laughs> you came to Romania. Yeah. Uh, how was it for you to, uh, to, to be in that, uh, let's say, uh, rock mafia here? How... Uh, <laughs> how <was it? laughs> What? <laughs> yeah, but uh, I mean, it depends. It depends of the mafia, right? <laughs> it depends of the mafia. I said rock and roll mafia from high, <laughs> let's say Bucharest, okay? Um, you know, it's, it was it was it was easy for me to move here. Uh, there was not a huge decision and to something that to complain or to decide or uh, for me. So me for me it was pretty clear when we met and and we fell in love uh, that I want to be with her. And I understood that she has a work here, so she kind of move out of Romania. So to me, it was easy to move here. Um, and then we were meeting people. I mean, she's connected already with the rock industry here because she was doing promotion before. Um, and she knows some, some people from the radios and from other bands. And so uh, uh, we went into this uh, rock mafia thing really easy. You know, we met, we met Aline from, from Trooper. Uh, he's a very cool guy, very nice. He's always helping us. Uh, very he's, nice people. He's the good guy in the mafia. He's the good guy on the mafia. Yeah. Um, I Consigliere. Met, I met. I met the band. Actually, we were we were playing a couple of times on the rehearsal room with Trooper, some covers, you know, some songs from Rainbow, that kind of things. Uh, very cool people, and and I just discovered that there is a lot of. Uh, there is a lot of uh, rock fans here, actually. Yeah, there are some. There are some, yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. Um, and they were very surprised that I was moving here, actually. <laughs> Big egos, too. But that happens everywhere. It happens everywhere. That course. happens everywhere. Um, one of the things that I learned uh, on my career, on my short career, it was that the, um, the most successful you are, uh, the humble you are. Uh, I had the chance to meet big, big, big uh, musicians in the f last few years. I met, obviously, all the people that I work with, like Richie Blackmore, Schenker, and all those guys. But I met Brian May. I met uh, Tony Ayami from Black Sabbath. I met some people from other bands, from Aerosmith, from a lot of bands. And um, they were the most humble people that I ever met, you know? 
But then when you met some people which is not that successful, but they think they are good. Uh, uh, frustration are uh, coming. Um, they're a little bit difficult to handle it. Um, I heard you have some kind of problems with <laughs> that. Yeah, sometimes because um, I think I think the most of the times some people they don't understand my successful, right? Um, It's obvious and in everybody's and, face. And they say, uh, "Why? Why this guy? Why this guy is? Why is this guy playing with Blackmore and Schenker and Vandenberg? Why the? Why this guy is not that special to play?" But I don't know. I mean, just I just got the gigs, you know. <laughs> Um, and I guess, and I guess that uh, if Blackmore says that I'm a good singer, and Michael Schenker is say that I'm a good singer, Vandenberg he wants me to play in the record, and and you know you are a good singer, so if you know they, you are a good singer, they shouldn't be that wrong. I think <laughs> maybe I'm not the best. I know that I'm not the best singer. There is a lot of great singers around. I have a lot of friends that sings better than me, um, but. I'm there playing with those guys. And that's it. Last question. Uh, no, two last questions. Um, are you going to take the uh, to be a Romanian citizen? You intend that? I think I can't because uh, I have double citizenship already from mm. Chile and Spain. So you don't have to learn the hymn? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> But obviously, obviously I'm, I'm, I'm based here already. Uh, uh, we're moving. Uh, we just bought a house now. In out of out of Bucharest, and obviously I'm gonna I'm gonna get my residence permission. Um, and my plan is to stay here. I mean, I love I love the country. Uh, I just discovered a nice, very nice country. We love we love Brasov, for example. We we go there very often. I love that Transylvania area. It's is so beautiful. The people is nice. The food is good. Um, Heavy for the liver. Heavy for the liver, yeah. Uh, d did you try uh, alcohol like Tsuika? I have a bottle of Tsuika at home. Yeah, I like it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. The the Romanian wine, super cool. Um, uh, the Chilean wine is super cool also. If yeah, you, If you go to the market and uh, you have, uh, let's say, uh, Osuta Lei, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, 100 Lei. Yeah, I know. Uh, uh, and you want to buy uh, some wine. If you buy at this money a French one, You are not sure it's gonna be okay, <laughs> but if you if you buy from a, a Chilean wine, it's gonna be okay. Uh, and I heard it is it is because you always have the sun um, to make a good wine. It's a, it's a Mediterranean um, weather in Chile, and we have the same grape than in France, in California, and Australia. So um, and the same weather conditions. That's why the French wines, Italian wines, Australian wines, uh, wines from South Africa, California, and Chile, of course, uh, we have the better wines. I have uh, an advice to give to you. If somebody here in Romania offers you some wine from their backyard, who make it in the backyard, never, ever say, It is a bad wine because you're gonna self you're, you're gonna have yourself an enemy. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Be polite, say it. Uh, ah, yeah, it no, good, no. It does not. But I, actually, uh, it, it, Corina, she can tell you uh, when we go to some restaurants. I my first, I mean, we love wine, and I and I and I know about wines because I I I was born in Chile, and um, and then uh, Leo Leoni from Gotar from Switzerland. He was he was teaching me a lot of about wines during two years. You so prefer the red one? I prefer the red one. Yes. That's the uh, one. Mostly we love the Italian wines. We like we love the wines from Tuscany or Sicily, that kind of wines. But we have some good bottles from France and some bottles from Chile and others. I I love wine. Um, but she can tell you that when we go to a restaurant, mostly in Brasov. Uh, I always ask for the uh, wine of the house to check mm -hmm. if it's nice. If it's nice, I ask for the for the glass of wine of the house. The problem here with the wine of the house is not the real wine of the house, you know? I know. Yeah. But sometimes they have some... I mean, if, if I don't like it, I ask for a bottle for <laughs> another wine. But 
normally normally um there is some good wines here uh, there's very good wines here um so so yeah actually we have some bottles from a couple of bottles from Romania um i think it's i think it's good it's nice um all all the wines from this area um, in bulgaria they have good wines too um in the south part of russia the crimea area they have good wines too so yeah i like it i like it um when you get married <laughs> That's Prob a question for me or for her? <laughs> <laughs> probably soon. No, 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 no. Probably no. Soon. <laughs> I mean, we are engaged already, so so that's ah, it's a matter of time. There's not much to left. It's a matter of time. Um, oh, party before? I want to know. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. I mean, we were... You, you are invited. <laughs> yeah, but, but, but he's going home at 11, so <laughs> there is no... <laughs> It's gonna be early in the morning. <laughs> um, uh, we were we were just waiting. Uh, we are engaged already, uh, so uh, we we're just waiting to you know to to properly uh, have a place here to buy a house and to to have my papers you know mm -hmm. in law for for to be here because now I have this um, Spanish European passport. So I just can be here for three months. I need to go out and then go in again for another three months. Um, so once I get the uh, residence permission, it's going to be a party. Last question. <laughs> uh, our uh, big rock star, uh, Gene Simmons. Yeah. I think because uh, of all the things that happens in the world, in the showbiz and so on, said uh, uh, rock is dead. Mm -hmm. What do you think about it? I think it's half right and half wrong. Um, rock is dead in the way that uh, rock music is not the mainstream music anymore, like in the 70s or the 80s. Even at the beginning of the 90s, before before the grunge. Um, um, I mean, to have a rock band, a new rock band, not a huge rock band like Scorpions or the kind of Guns N' Roses or um, or Metallica um, it's really hard to get into the market it's really hard um, people is not listening too much rock anymore there's not too much in the mainstream radios um, it's really hard to to be on the spot um, but in the other hand since we are becoming again in a underground kind of music Again, we are involving on this uh, way that the rock music is not for the masses anymore. Um, but there is a lot of bands. I mean, if, if, if you check, for example, my record label, Frontiers, they are releasing new music every week. Every week there is a new band coming from all over the world. They're signing bands from Brazil. They're signing bands from... Actually, they're signing a band from Romania. Uh, I don't know. I don't know the names of the guys. You know the guys. Uh, the, the the singer of uh, Cargo, I think. The band yeah, Cargo. Ah, oh, I heard something. Da da. I know what you're mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So uh, so you know it's. I mean there is there is a lot of bands. The thing the only thing that they are under the radar, you know. So the people is they are not uh, getting the news that there is a new bands coming. Fun fact, uh, it was Metallica was sold out in Bucharest two years ago for the first time. <laughs> for the first time? Yes, sold out. <laughs> but for yeah. the first time, for the first time. one day they sold all the tickets. And I said, whoa, <laughs> what a surprise, because in the 90s when they used to... I mean, I, I saw a lot of bands, Metallica I, I saw face. a lot of, uh, they're big now. Like, for example, Ar Alter Bridge. I remember they play in Madrid like uh, six years ago or seven years ago and there was there was like 300 people in the venue uh <laughs> you know i remember and they were successful in america already i remember uh, europe is kind of different animal i guess yeah i remember i remember uh, to watch from this point of view dream theater the first time they were coming to south america there was 2003 yeah they were pretty successful all over the world and 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 they got like 
I don't know, 50 people in Chile. 50 tickets. So, you know, it's... <laughs> It depends think, on the market. Guns N' Roses have the same story at the beginning <laughs> somehow. I played, I played, even even being part of Rainbow already, uh, some couple of years ago, I was playing with uh, with Corleone, with the the band that I did with uh, Leo Leone from Gotar. We were playing a show in Germany, and it was like, uh, if I remember correct, there was a show in Hamburg, and it was like, I don't know, 25 tickets. Mm. It know, happens. Sometimes happens. I, I, I don't think it's really depressing. It should be for fun, me, I For guess. me, it was a little bit because <laughs> I was coming from the Rainbow Gig. And we were playing, that year we were playing in, in Russia, in the Olimpinsky Stadium in Moscow for 40,000 people. <laughs> so coming from there to 25, it was a little bit... Ai vrut să spui ce faci și te-am întrerupt, Corina. Da, am vrut să spun că e vorba de, de vibe-ul oamenilor. Nu mai, nu, mai vibrează, nu mai vibrează muzica asta ca și înainte. E o, e o altă tendință. E ca un state of mind. Lumea nu mai ascultă rock, de aceea nu... Cred că ai văzut și tu că sunt aceiași oameni care vin mereu la concerte. E un grup micuț, restrâns. Comunitatea, cum am și văzut. Și scade din spune, ce în ce da. mai mult. Nu știu să vedem ce se întâmplă cu ăștia de 15 ani de acum încolo, sunt foarte curios. Uh, aș vrea să mai uh, repeți încă o dată, să mai vorbim încă o dată despre concertul de pe 21 mai de la Arenele Romane. Da, deci o să fie pe 21 mai la Arenele Romane. Vom vedea ora, momentan nu știm, fiindcă pică într-o vineri. Uh, să sperăm că nu vor mai fi restricții după ora uh, 6-7-8. Uh, uite că și asta este o problemă, e da. E o problemă... Did you ever, uh, sorry, did you ever uh, think at a, a big gig before the, before the sunset? Before the what, sorry? The sunset. The sunset. Because the sunset? Uh, uh, we're talking about the show yeah, at yeah, Arele yeah. Romane mm-hmm. and uh, if you have to be at the eight <laughs> at home... Ah, yeah, yeah. Actually, that normally happens on the festivals. Uh, when you play a big festival, sometimes you play... In the daytime, okay. So it's it's pretty much okay. And for example, uh, with Richie, uh, normally we play by night, and he like to play by night for the stage lights. But the show we did in Spain in 2019, it was the venue was so cool because it was a big castle. It was the stage, and uh, behind the stage was the uh, the beach already, the sea, the Mediterranean Sea. So everything was so nice that he wanted to play with the before the sunset. So we play like we start to play like eight, I remember, and it was daylight. Mm-hmm. But mostly on the festivals you play from twelve. De unde luăm bilete? De pe ia bilet.ro. Am înțeles deci și la vânzare doar online. La intrare nu o să vindem bilete. Uh, în prezentarea în mă rog Textul de sub acest material video pe care îl facem aici o să pun eu și linkul de Facebook. Cine vrea să știe mai multe, găsește și pe Facebook găsește evenimentul. Pe, exact. Da. E, e un picuț complicat să organizezi evenimente în perioada aceasta. Chiar ne încurcă destul de mult restricțiile. Avem acum în vedere să punem și teste rapide. Păi cred că o să nu știu dacă se va organizatorii vor fi dar, obligați. Nu se știe da. încă nimic. E dificil fiindcă se creează și multe conflicte la un moment dat între organizatori, artiști, cei care cumpără bilete. Gândește-te că unele concerte s-au anulat concerte mari și sunt persoane care și-au cumpărat probabil deja 8 bilete la 8 concerte care nu se mai susțin. Automat asta implică faptul că nu vor mai cumpăra în avans bilete. E așa un cerc vicios. Lumea nu cumpără fiindcă nu știe ce se întâmplă. Noi probabil stăm și așteptăm să vedem ce va face. E publicul. în toată lumea problema asta. E în toată lumea problema asta. Dacă se anulează turnee și artiștii sunt cumva, se dă, se dă peste cap practic programul lor, fiindcă probabil au și alte turnee în așteptare, se suprapun unele cu altele și e destul de complicat, așa că noi ne așteptăm ca fanii să ne susțină mai mult. 
Fiindcă păi, practic de acolo... Dacă ne strângem 500, cred că nu e puțin lucru. Așa zic și eu. It, it is gonna be like the, uh, the first gig of Ronnie. <laughs> Only 500 people. But I, I understand the situation. I mean, it's, it's okay. It's okay. So you don't know a dirty word in Romania. I know <laughs> some. Kidding. I know some. I know some, but I use. I normally use it when I'm driving. So that's it. <laughs> I it's like not both. that dirty. It's it's fun. It's funny because it's dirty for him, but for us, for <laughs> Romanians, not dirty. It's very common. <laughs> I, I was blown away, but uh, the difference in Spanish when you say "mi amor" mm-hmm. or "mi mujer." Ah. Mi mujer, uh, it's already a kind of wife or even uh, actually a yeah, wife. When, when you get married, yeah. When you get married, you say mi mujer because it's actually on the in the paper is your woman. <laughs> yeah. But but I, I mean, I think I think at the end it depends on the feeling. I, I, I call Corina when I talk with somebody else. I, I talk my wife normally when we're involving in the same... Uh, email or something my wife gonna tell you something because actually she's not just organizing this show for Bucharest but she normally manage all my business you know she's like my manager actually so she the um, next Sharon Osborne she, yeah, yeah she take um, Wendy Dio Wendy Dio uh, she take care of uh, of uh, the interview to schedule and the uh, when I need to book the studio for recordings and everything so normally when I have a message is like I reply Talk to my wife. That's yes, I know that because I talk to her because of yeah, the show. Yeah, I like a lot both of you and thank you so much for coming. My pleasure. Keep in touch. Yep, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Mulțumim și noi.